Mount Zion Church, we're so glad that you have come to worship the Lord with us. It's good to worship our God. He's been so good to us in this season of Thanksgiving. We are giving thanks to him for blessing us, pouring out his goodness upon us. We're worshiping online. We're glad that you are joining us wherever you are. We're going to sing his praise. We're going to go to the word. We're going to share in the Lord's Supper. If you want to join us in the Lord's Supper, you can get some bread and some juice. So let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you, Lord God. You have been so, so good to us, Lord God. You've poured out blessings upon us, Lord, all the days of our lives. We thank you above all else for our Lord, our Savior Jesus, that he offered up himself there on that cross for us all, that we have come to know your mercy, your grace, your goodness, and your love. We ask, Father, that you would fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit as we worship you now. Lord, that Jesus would be lifted up in our hearts, Lord God, that we would go forth, Lord God, to a world that needs you, a world that needs the love of Jesus. And so, Father, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you. In his name, amen and amen, amen. Let's sing our God's praise. All of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and, and every need you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more than enough
like I'm surrounded I'm surrounded by you it may look like I'm surrounded but I'm surrounded by you it may look like I'm surrounded but I'm surrounded by you We're surrounded by you
Lord, we lift our hearts up in gratitude. We give you thanks, Father, for giving us your son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord God. He left all the glory of heaven to come to this earth, Lord God, to walk the roads of this earth, Lord God, finally to go to that cross, taking upon himself the griefs and the sorrows and the sins of this world, Father, to set us free, to bring your mercy, your grace, your goodness, your loving kindness to us all. And we are so grateful and we are so thankful. Jesus, truly, you are enough. You are enough, Lord God. This world offers us nothing, nothing that compares to your goodness, to your love, to your mercy, to the strength, to the courage, to the confidence that you give us. And Jesus, we love you. We love you so much, Jesus. We're so, so thankful. We ask, Lord, as we worship you here now online, Lord, uh, folks worshiping you all around this world, even right now, Lord, as we share here, Lord God, fill us all with your Holy Spirit. Lord God, fill us with your Spirit now. Lord God, that as your word is lifted up here, as we sing your praise, as we share in the bread and the cup, Lord God, you would stir up that flame, that flame of your spirit, that flame of love and strength and courage and confidence, Lord God. We thank you, we praise you, we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. What a great God. Yes, I want to thank God for these musicians. Amen. It is so good to sing his praise. Well, it is good to worship our God. Here we are online again. Certainly, as we come together here worshiping now, we want to be praying for our nation, for our world. As this pandemic uh, continues on, we are very thankful that our Lord tells us how to make the most of all seasons of life, how to look, in other words, for the opportunities, the opportunities that Jesus gives us to do eternal work. In other words, to bring that saving love, that rescuing love, that eternal, steadfast love of Jesus to a very broken world. And so I want to just praise God and thank God for for Mount Zion Church and just the ways that this congregation has been working so hard to, to reach to a needy, broken world. And there are a lot of opportunities. If you're not... On our email news list, news list, contact us. We'll get you on our newsletter list, our prayer concerns. Uh, check out our website, mzprays.org, and we will get you connected into this family, this, this team working together to bring the love of Jesus to a very broken world. Hey, uh, this Wednesday night, the night before Thanksgiving, we're going to have an online just series of testimonies from members of the congregation just telling, telling us how good God has been. And I hope you'll, uh, you'll tune in Wednesday, 7 p.m., and I think we'll probably be running it all day during uh, Thanksgiving Day. But it's so good to just tell folks, tell folks how good God has been to us all. So we're going to pray, and then we'll go to the Word of God. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you, Lord God, that in all the seasons of life, in challenging, difficult seasons, Lord God, in all seasons, Father, you have given us a great task to bring your love to a broken, hurting, struggling world. And Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes Open our eyes to see the opportunities. In other words, Father, we're asking that you would just open our eyes to see how it is, Lord God, that we can bring your love uh, to this world all around us. Father, we pray for all that we're seeking to do as a congregation. Lord God, lifting up Jesus, bringing your love to the poor, to the needy, to the lost, to the broken, to children, to young people, Lord God. We ask, Father, that you would draw near to us, to your people, Lord God, in all this world, in every nation, Father, that we would be lifting up Jesus. We do pray for our nation. We pray for our world, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that you would lead us all in paths of righteousness. Lord God, we pray, Father, for those who are struggling, for those who are in need, for those who are not well. We pray, Lord God, for those who find themselves just filled with anxieties and fears. We pray, Lord God, that you would draw near to each and every 
one. And Father, as we go to your word now, speak to our hearts. We ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, over these uh, weeks, we have been looking at getting a grateful heart. And what we've seen is that gratitude is not something that just comes naturally to us. It doesn't just happen. Things can be as awesome as they could possibly be, and somehow still inside of us, we don't have much gratitude. You can, you can have everything going for you and still be a mess. So gratitude doesn't just come naturally. God says, look, here's what you need to be doing. You need to constantly be giving thanks. Giving thanks. Usually we think, if I'm grateful, then I'll give thanks. And here's God saying, nope, nope. If you will give thanks and give thanks and give thanks. In other words, if we will be expressing our gratitude, if we will be telling God, even when we don't feel so grateful, how thankful we are for how good he's been to us. How thankful we are that we have food in our bellies, clothes on our backs, roof over our heads. How thankful we are for this amazing love that God has poured out on us all the days of our lives. He's lifted us up every time we've fallen. He's, he's brought mercy and grace and forgiveness when we failed. This God who's never given up on us. If we'll just keep telling him and telling him and telling him how thankful we are, then what happens is there's a gratitude, a gratitude that grows in our hearts. And what we've been seeing as we've been going to the Word is if we don't get that gratitude by giving thanks and giving thanks and giving thanks, then we're, we're grumpy, we're thoughtless, we're selfish people. In other words, if I'm just feeling sorry for myself, if I'm frustrated and angry, if I don't, if I don't have a, a, a gratitude in my heart for all that God has done for me, then I, I won't be a blessing to those around me. I won't be bringing uh, very much love and goodness to the world around me if I'm just always angry or feeling sorry for myself. So what we're going to look at today is this. How do we move from selfish to satisfied? Jesus will teach us how to stop living the, the, the selfish lives that, we, that just seem so normal. I mean, what, what the world makes look normal is really pretty selfish. Jesus teaches us how to move from selfish to satisfied, to satisfaction, to contentment in life. If I don't have any contentment, if I don't have any satisfaction in life, then without me even knowing it more and more, I'll just be living a selfish life. You know, when we look at Jesus, when we look at this amazing life that Jesus lived when he came here to this earth, uh, we see a, a depth of, of satisfaction and contentment in his heart. He was content. The circumstances of his life weren't great. <laughs> they weren't great at all. I mean, he grew up dirt poor. You know, we see all those paintings, old paintings of Jesus with this snow white robe and everything looks great. He was dirt poor. The circumstances of his life weren't great, but he had a contentment. He had a satisfaction a satisfaction in his heart so that he could live a life that was selfless, not selfish. He wasn't always just trying to, to get some contentment and some satisfaction because he was content. He was satisfied. And he'll teach us. He'll teach us how to make that same move from, from selfishness to satisfaction. So let's begin in the Gospel of Luke here in chapter 12. And we're going to see uh, a story uh, of, that Jesus tells. So someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So Jesus is teaching, there's a crowd, and someone says, Jesus, my brother won't divide the inheritance with me. Tell him to do it. Look, he's standing right here, Jesus. Tell him to do this. So at verse uh, 14 then, he said, but Jesus said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? He's saying, look, that's not my job right now, but let me tell you something. Look at verse 15 then. He said to them, take care. So now he, he says to the, to the man who just asked him the question and to the crowd, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. He's saying, why are you so worried about this money? Why are you so worried about this? He says, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. He says, this is not what life is about. He's saying this thing you're so concerned about, this is not what life is about. 
And so at verse 16 then, he told them a parable. A parable is a, a story that has a point to it. So he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully, at verse 17 then, and he thought to himself, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? So, so this man, his, his, his crops, he's an abundant crop, he's, he's got plenty. Why is he even this, asking this question, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? It seems like the answer would have been pretty clear and evident. Okay, Jesus, the people listening to Jesus knew, yeah, why is that dude even asking the question? A whole lot of us are hungry. A whole lot of us don't have any food in our bellies. So if someone's got an abundant harvest, got more than he can even have any place to store, I think he could be feeding us hungry people. And of course, it's the same today. We live in a very hungry, needy world. So at verse 18 then, he said, so the man answered his own question, I will do this, I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. At verse 19, he goes on, I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. This dude is not content with what he has. He had barns to store up enough grain and, and food for, for all that he, he needed, but he wasn't content. And so he does the selfish thing. He does the selfish thing and just builds more barns to store and keep up more and more and more for himself instead of doing the, 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 the loving, good, kind thing of, of giving to those who were hungry all around him. He just accumulates more and more and more for himself. And so what do we see here? Well, let's go on at verse 20 then. So God said to him, fool, this night your soul, I don't want God to say to me, fool. That's not what I want to hear God say to me on my dying day. Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? What good has any of this done to you? God says to the man, so at verse 21, then Jesus says, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So what do we see in this story? We see that if I don't have contentment and satisfaction in my heart, if I don't have gratitude, contentment, satisfaction in my heart, I'll end up being far more selfish than I could have ever imagined. I mean, to have so much and I'm not opening my hand freely to the poor and needy, to be so blessed and I'm not spending my life being a blessing to people all around me. But see, if I'm not content in what I have, if I'm not satisfied in life, then I'm constantly gonna just be looking for more, for what will make me feel okay, what will make me feel content and satisfied. So Jesus is warning us here, none of this stuff will ever satisfy you. None of this stuff will ever satisfy you. And if you don't have any contentment and satisfaction in your heart, you're gonna end up being a fool. You're gonna end up being a fool, missing the very point of life. I mean, what does the Bible tell us over and over and over again? Above all else, hold unfailing your love for one another. The greatest of these is love. Paul said to the church, the Philippian church, I pray that your love will abound. If I don't have contentment and satisfaction in my heart, then I'm just gonna be living for myself to try to get that satisfaction. I'm an old baby boomer, so I remember Mick Jagger jumping up and down saying, I can't get no satisfaction. Now he's still jumping up and down, just saying, I can't get no satisfaction. If you don't have satisfaction and contentment, you'll never learn how to love because you'll always be selfish. So here's Jesus saying to that man and that crowd around him, look, I can teach you how to be content how to be satisfied. I can, I can teach you so you don't have to be this selfish person. Let's go on now and look in the book of Proverbs. So here we find these words. Sheol, Sheol means death, and Abaddon means destroyer. Two words meaning death. Sheol and Abaddon are never satisfied. It's like you, you got this poetic image here of death, never satisfied, taking one another, and another, and another, and another. But look what the point is. And never satisfied are the eyes of man. Never satisfied are the eyes of man. 
So what's our, what, what do we learn here? Anything you can see with your eyes, anything you can see with your eyes will not bring you contentment and satisfaction in life. Or the contentment and satisfaction it might bring you for a moment or a season will not last. Eventually, anything you can see with your eyes will fail, will fail you in bringing contentment and satisfaction to your heart, to your soul. So we think that man in the story Jesus told, he, he thought that if, if he knew that he had all the, these, these riches laid up for himself, that he'd be content. No, he was a fool. He was a fool. We think if I could get this, if I could have that, if this person would be in my life, if I would have those circumstances, then I'd be content. But anything you can see will never, will never bring a satisfaction and a contentment that lasts. And this is why the selfish living of this world that looks so normal is ultimately so, so wrong. It's, it's ultimately just pointless. It's all in vain, as, as the Bible says, because nothing ever works. You can have the, 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 the perfect life and you'll end up being a mess inside, a mess inside because nothing you can see. You know, this is where relationships go wrong so often. Marriages struggle because, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, a, a guy finds this, this girl, this, this woman who, who just makes him feel so good and so happy and so satisfied in life. And, and then, you know, time goes on and then other things are happening and he's no longer being happy and content and satisfied in life, but he's depending on her to make him content, happy, and satisfied. She can't do it. Nobody, nothing in this world, ultimately, finally, can satisfy us. You know, it's said that our hearts are restless. Our hearts are restless until they rest in the one who is unseen, in the one who, who cannot be, you know, held in our arms, the one who cannot be heard with our ears or seen with our eyes. Our hearts are restless until we rest in the unseen. God in the unseen love of God. So let's, let's go on here. Let's see a third truth now about contentment, satisfaction. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, Paul writes this letter. He's in jail. He's in a Roman jail. He was locked up again and again. He was locked up because here he is, a Jewish man, a Hebrew Israelite man in the Roman Empire. There was all this racism, and he's going around telling everyone about this Jewish Messiah named Jesus, or as they said his name in, in their language, Yeshua. He's going around, and so there's all this racism coming against coming against Paul. He's locked up again and again and again. And these followers of Jesus, they were living so differently from everyone else. You know, and so again, he's in jail. And if you're in a Roman jail, they didn't feed you. In wintertime, they didn't give you blankets and warm clothing. If you didn't have somebody bringing you food, if you didn't have somebody bringing you blankets and warm clothing in the winter, you were in deep trouble. So Paul had been in this jail for a while and he had been without for a while. He, he didn't have much food to eat, hardly anything at all. He didn't have warm clothes and blankets, but now he, he writes uh, to the Philippian church, thanking them because they had learned of his situation. They had come to his aid. So he's thanking them and he says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And that's what we need, right? We need to learn in whatever situation, because if we're not content, if we're not satisfied, yep, we'll be selfish. We'll never get satisfied in anything, and we'll just end up living a selfish life. So Paul, in jail, bad situation. He doesn't know are the soldier's gonna come one day and just drag him out and execute him. He doesn't know. But he said, I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Have you learned that? Have we learned that? In whatever situation, in whatever's going on, have we learned how to be content? So at verse 12, he starts talking about what he learned. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. I can handle life. I can be content, satisfied in life, no matter what's going on. In any and every circumstance, 
I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, whatever the circumstances of my life are, I've learned the secret. There's a secret to us. The world doesn't know it. That's why the world is constantly, constantly trying to grab something that will give them some kind of peace and contentment. He says, I've learned the secret. So look at verse 13 then. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. If you learn, if you learn how to draw on the strength and the courage that Jesus will give you in any and all circumstances, you can be content. If we learn how to grab hold of that strength, how to grab hold of that courage, then no matter what's going on, then we know I can handle it. You know, see, here's the deal. Things can be great right now, but we start imagining, well, what if this happened? Or what if that happened? And then we get afraid about the future, right? And then we're saying to ourselves, I won't be able to handle it. I won't be able to handle it. And then all the contentment, all the peace, all the satisfaction in our soul just leaves, even when things are great. But if I can learn from Jesus, if I can learn from Jesus how to grab hold of that strength that our God will give us, how to grab hold of that courage, to handle whatever's coming around the bend, whatever is next. If I find myself in some horrendous circumstance, in some super difficult time, if I can learn from Jesus in that moment how to have the strength, the courage, the confidence, the peace that passes all understanding, if I can learn from Jesus, then I'll be content. I'll be satisfied. Look in 2 Corinthians here. Paul writes this letter to the church in Corinth, and he was particularly talking about a physical affliction that came on his body. He, he called it a thorn in the flesh. And apparently he, he had some eye disease. And he talks in one of his letters about his face. You know, knew, he said, I know my appearance is a trial to you. And he talks about how he could hardly see. He was almost blind, and he prayed, and he prayed. And God didn't heal this this affliction that he had. He didn't heal this eye disease, uh, but God told him, look, when you're weak, you'll be strong. So look at this at verse 10. Paul says, for the sake of Christ then. No, go back. There we go. <laughs> Second Corinthians. In verse 10, for the sake of Christ then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution. He says, I'm content no matter what's happening. Why? For when I am weak, then I am strong. He said, I found out that it didn't matter how much life beat me up. It didn't matter if I was going blind. It didn't matter if I had food in my belly or not. It doesn't matter if I'm um, um, in prison waiting to be executed. Paul said, it doesn't matter because I discovered that though I am weak, though this world beats me up, though this world is hard, and wow, is it a hard world. This world will break your heart. This world will just knock us down. This world is so hard. But here's Paul saying, but I am content. I'm not frustrated and I'm not angry. I'm not scared to death. Because I found that no matter how weak I am in and of myself, there's a strength that comes to me. There's a strength that Jesus gives me. So I can handle it. I can handle it no matter what. I can handle it, and so I am content. I don't have to, to think like, okay, I gotta get this fixed, and I gotta get this in order, and, I, and I'll have to know what to do here, and I'll have to be able to do that. I don't, I, he says, I'm not worried about all of that, because I know the strength, the courage that Jesus has brought to my heart. Will you then look to him, look to this Jesus and say, Jesus, I, I can't do this. Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm falling apart here. Jesus, I, I don't know how I'm going to handle this. Jesus, I don't know if, if that thing that I'm scared of, um, that I'm terrified of happens. Jesus, I, I, don't, I don't know that I can do it. Jesus, help me. Jesus, give me strength. Learn from Jesus. Learn from Jesus that that strength will come. That courage will come. He won't fail you. He won't abandon you. He won't 
leave you. Paul knew if he died in that jail, if he, if he, he starved to death because nobody did bring him any food, if he, he, would just, if he you know, died of hypothermia because there were no warm clothes and blankets in the wintertime, he knew he could handle it. He knew he could handle it because he knew Jesus would never fail to give him the strength and the courage that he desperately, desperately needed. Wow. If I'm not content, if I'm not satisfied, if I'm living in fear and, and worry, if I'm, if I'm trying to find some kind of contentment in my heart with the things of this world, uh, then I'll, I'll always just be a, a selfish person. I'll never be that person of love that my God's commanded me to be. If, if, I, if I think the things of this world will satisfy me, they never will. But if I learn from Jesus, if I learn from Jesus, that he'll give me the strength and the courage I need. Then I can be content no matter what. There's one more thing to look at. Look in here at the Gospel of Matthew now. It's Matthew chapter 5 at verse 6. Some very simple words, but wow, are they profound. Blessed, this is Jesus talking to a huge crowd of people all around him. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Though most of the world is never satisfied, the most of the world is never content, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they're the ones who will be satisfied. Now, what does the word righteousness mean? It means a right relationship with God and the right living that comes from that right relationship with God. So, so if I make it my goal if I make it the goal of my life to have a right relationship with God, in other words, to know God and to obey God. If I make it the goal of my life to know him and to obey him, I'll be content. I'll be satisfied. That's a goal that will bring satisfaction and contentment to our hearts. Because knowing this great God, having a, a, a right relationship, in other words, knowing the love, the mercy, the goodness of this great God, that's what our hearts were made for. That's what we were created to, to live in. In other words, to live in the love and the goodness, to live in relationship with God. If my goal is to know him, to have that righteousness of knowing God and then obeying him, living as he's commanded me, as he's told me how to live, there's contentment, there's satisfaction there because that's what we were created for. It's like a, a tiger. You take this magnificent creature, a tiger. You take that tiger from the wilderness and put it in a little cage in a zoo and the tiger just paces back and forth all day long. How can that tiger be content? How can that tiger be uh, satisfied when he can't do what he was made to do? We were made to know God. We were made to know the love of God. We were made to obey God, to, to live according to what God tells us to, to do. We are made to, to love. Right? as God tells us again and again to do. And if that's my goal, then there'll be contentment, there'll be satisfaction in that. But here's the deal. You know, the Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. In other words, uh, God's saying, look, uh, you can try all you want to get to know me. <laughs> you're not gonna get there. You can try all you want to try to obey me, but you're a mess. He says, look, here's what I've done. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. I, I'm, I'm giving my son on that cross. He's going to come with my mercy, my grace, my love to you. He's going to go to that cross. He's going to take all the junk from your heart, all that filth, all that filth from your life, the junk, the mess from your heart. He's going to take it on himself and go to that cross. And you look to him. You look to him. You humbly put your trust, put your faith in him and you will find that relationship with me. You'll find that righteousness, that right relationship with me that will give you satisfaction, that will give you contentment. Wow, you'll learn when you look to Jesus, you look to my son, you'll learn how to obey me. You can't do it yourself, but you put your faith in Jesus. You put your faith in Jesus and you'll be content 
you'll be satisfied. Look finally here, Psalm 17, these beautiful words. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. When you know God, when you know this great God, when you know his love, when you've come to know him because you finally just did that one thing that we can do, you cried out to Jesus and said, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. When you know God, there's a contentment, a satisfaction that comes that will never leave you. What's this about here? When I awake, when I close my eyes in death and I open my eyes again, still I will be content. Still I will be satisfied. Your love will remain. Wow, what an awesome God. What an awesome God we have. A God who who says, Craig, Craig, look, you don't know how to do this thing. You'll never be satisfied. Let me satisfy you. Let me fill your heart with peace. Craig, let me teach you. Let me show you how to live. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you. And we just lift our hearts before you now. We pray, Lord God, that you would draw near, that you would draw near to each and every one of us, Lord God. Oh, Father, we we come to you now to lift up this bread and this cup. We come, Lord God, asking that as, as we feed on the love of Jesus, as we drink deeply the love of Jesus, you would fill our hearts with contentment, fill our hearts with gratitude that we would be a thankful people, that we would be a people who love as you have loved us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, on that night, our Lord Jesus was betrayed. He took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, And he gave it to them. And he said, this is my blood of a new covenant, a new promise that was shed for you and all the world for the forgiveness of sin. Drink this and be glad. If you have faith in Jesus, take the bread, drink from the cup. If you don't have that faith, you can put your faith in him now. Put your faith in Jesus. Feed on his love. Drink deeply the love of Jesus. upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you
God is good. He is so good. Let's just all say amen. amen. Mount Zion Church, lift up Jesus. Amen and amen. 